Let me, I, I was with um, 20 CLOs yesterday, and uh, this is what they told me. So I, I asked a similar question. LOS implementation, right there. Sustainability. Being able to sustain, keep quality, but increase quantity dramatically. Cultural issues. Convincing people that learning is important in the organization. Increasing online dramatically, but having the same impact, the same quality, and the same outcomes. In-source versus outsource. Nightmare problem. And you end up in some organizations where the people on the inside are doing all the horrible stuff, just the managing the process, and all the interesting stuff is being done outsourced. Obviously, we're never going to go back to a time when everything is done in-house, but that balance is still a dramatic issue. Consulting versus building. What is my role? Am I a builder or a consultant? Social learning. How do you enable it? It's all right to talk about it. How do you actually get stuff moving in the organization? I'll stop soon. I've got hundreds of them. Uh, getting buy-in, getting credibility, establishing credibility, doing more with less. There we are. Building management capabilities in my learning team. Building communication capabilities so that the rest of the organization understands them. Managing transitions for the, for the company. In other words, managing the transition from um, one level to the next. Huge attrition, massive failure, huge cost. How do you actually, it's not just about putting them on a leadership program, it's much more complicated than that. And on it goes, on it goes, on it goes, on it goes. So there are some really big challenges, and guess what? I'm not going to deal with all of them, but I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to tackle a few. Um, I'm going to be signing my book at lunchtime. I was terrified about this signing because if no one turns up, I'm a big prat. Particularly as uh, Clive Shepard would be sitting next to him, the queue about 500 yards long. And when, when the books came on the screen you know, this morning, when he said, Everyone know all these books, and someone next to me said, I, I know. Who's that one on the end? That really instilled me with confidence. So, um, all of these challenges are in the book, and I wrote the book because. I wanted to help people who are trying to navigate their way through this macro and micro world. And some of the, if you don't pay attention to the detail, like if you screw up you know, individual sign or whatever it is, you're dead. But I also think that if you don't pay attention to the big stuff that's coming your way, you're also dead. So I'm just going to share a few and we can, we can stop. <coughs> I'll go and carry on if you want or we'll stop and talk if you want to. But this is, this is from last week at BET with Ken Robinson. And this is Brian Mavis, who that's what he does. He does these thoughts, illuminates thoughts. This is from Ken. Teaching is not a delivery system, it's an art form. And he's using the teaching word, interestingly. But there's a real issue embedded in that for us, which is that if we focus only on the process, we focus on making it neat, smooth, building a new LMS, making sure people can get in, but we don't focus on what we're trying to do with the people going through the learning, both in terms of output, i.e. what they can do differently, but also what they think, what their attitude is, how they've aligned with colleagues, what this has done to embody or disembody the culture of the organisation. There's a whole lot of complexity in that area of delivery system versus doing something more complicated and more profound. And most of us, guess what, we just focus on getting the delivery right, because if you don't get that right, everything else falls apart. But there's an increasing need to push learning into the bigger picture of what the organisation is trying to achieve. And that's a big challenge, and it featured in one or two of your challenges, and it features in one or two of the challenges that people were talking to yesterday. Another issue, Sugamitra, um, this morning, what did he say? A quote from him. He said um, something very simple. Schools enabled empires, they are now obsolete. Is there anyone in this room who genuinely, but something's obsolete this is, is anyone in this room who believes that schools will not be here in 10 years? Anyone? No. Does that invalidate what he was saying? No, not at all. There's no one saying, well, he's got that wrong, so everything else is like a low-volt rubbish. And I think that's the dilemma that we face, that 
maybe we're not ever going to be just, let's just have learning in the cloud and we throw everyone together and have this fantastic fun time, everything will be fantastic, everyone will learn for themselves. We don't live in a world, most of us, where that would be acceptable, whether culturally where it would be a complete disaster. But we can learn from what he's saying. Because embedded in that are really useful insights about the way people learn, what makes it, and I think what goes for kids can go for adults. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult, maybe a little bit more nervous, but essentially that idea of community and discovery and engagement, all of those things we know are really positive and important parts of the learning process. And how do we take those and embed them? And that's the kind of that's the Ken bit of it, I think. So I really enjoyed that talk. And even if I've read articles showing holes in the wall as just barren, empty bits of concrete because someone's nicked the computer and flogged it in the market, or tales of adolescent boys kicking younger kids off in order they can play war games that, with very little learning going on, the, the essence of what he's saying, I think, is, is absolutely right. It's about discovery, and we don't build enough discovery into learning, and people love it when elements of it are brought in, but often in a controlled way. That's why simulation is having a massive comeback, because it was so expensive to do one-off simulations or bring in a, a crowd of actors every time to do it for you. Unbelievably expensive, but we see software now that allows people to get right into the action and control the action, make decisions. And, and do it collegiately, argue about what would work in this circumstance, what would work about in that other circumstance. And guess what? People love it, they're engaged, they learn, and the impact is absolutely fantastic. So let's move on. This is a big one, and there's a whole crap about neuroscience, that everyone puts neuroscience in front of anything, like you have neuro cereal, be good for your brain in the mornings, or and neuroscience does this and proves that. And it's very hard for people to work their way through the pundits to the cognitive scientists. But you've got to do it. I, I think that it's in, in my book, it's, a, it's what I call a game changer. The three I've chosen are technology, learning analytics, and neuroscience. And there is stuff coming through now which is so powerful and so conclusive that we'd be insane not to just note it and run an audit against these things. And you know, these five coming from the Royal Society's <coughs> book on or pamphlet on brain waves, which is the neuroscience of learning. They brought a panel together of the best people in Britain. It's not, a, not globally, but in Britain. And what we know is that far from hundreds and hundreds of years of believing that learning is entirely rational in a prefrontal cortex. We now know that we learn best when our whole brain is engaged. And that includes our emotions. That learning is an emotional experience. And part of what frightens us and, and what stops us learning is fear, boredom, and all the and sitting too much. Why well, made you stand up? That if, when, you, when you all buy the Apple Watch in April, one thing that it will do is every hour, it will silent, quietly, tap your wrist to remind you to stand up. And that, why are they doing that? Because they're insane. Why are they doing that? Because it's based on research done in the US showing that even standing up for a minute an hour in your day makes a considerable difference to your overall health and your ability to retain and, and be efficient. One minute in one hour, that's unbelievable. The, the chief executive of LinkedIn has all his one-to-ones as walk talk meetings. Because A, it gets them out, B, they have better conversations, C, they both feel much better than sitting in an office all day, every day. We sit too much, we don't, and we, we don't exercise it. Exercise, if you want to train your brain, you're much better off going for a walk for 20 minutes than doing brain games or doing it many times crossword. But what, what exercise does, it refreshes your brain, it gets ready to learn more. The brain gets tired, we have so much cognitive capacity and we drain it. Exercise gets us back into cognitive capacity. How many training courses involve walking, standing up even, mostly, look at us all, we're all sitting. And in many ways, 
it's the worst way to program a human being to just sit and listen. You don't do it very well. And our brain has a certain amount of ability to focus and concentrate, and that will drain away. You'll feel it draining away during the day. Your performance at 4 o'clock will be a hell of a lot worse than your performance at 9 o'clock. We gave you little tests, cognitive tests. We could, we could prove that in an instant. We know as well that the physical environment is important. Sitting in a building without walls, without windows and walls, without windows. But, but we also know that people spending a lot of money on the physical environment, that definitely has an impact. And in learning, it has a big impact. If you make learning look special, different, people treat it differently. And you know, I, I was with National Australia Bank in, in Melbourne. They've created their learning centre to look nothing like a bank. It, it looks like a, a, a completely free open area of walls that you can pull down blinds to create additional walls, complete flexibility, um, built of wood, kind of rough wood, hewn rather than concrete. It looks very uncorporate and people come there to hang out because it's just different. Get away from being in a bank. It works. But what we also forget is that environment that we live in, maybe half our time, is the online environment. And who pays attention to that? To colour, design, what it feels like to be in that online environment. And we know that if we can make that online environment exciting, engaging, somewhere you want to go and want to be, somewhere where you can hang out with people, more learning will take place, more effective learning will take place. And we also know that the ageing brain is different but not necessarily worse. And maybe the biggest issue of all, for all of us, is what we do with the ageing workforce. <coughs> what kind of person is talking about? That, that the, 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 the research coming from the States is almost saying that dementia is a lifestyle choice. They're now saying that type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle choice. That if you look after yourself in terms of your, what you eat, you look after yourself in terms of weight and fitness, you are almost inevitably not going to get type 2 diabetes. If you are overweight, you don't exercise, you eat all the wrong things, you are almost likely to get type 2 diabetes. You can control it, you have the power. They're also they're saying now that dementia seems to be a function of lack of brain engagement, and lack of challenge and lack of learning. Later in life, the neural pathways solidify, others fall away, and as the brain begins to disintegrate, because it doesn't need to do anything. And there's that wonderful metaphor that the neuroscientist said on the BBC recently, saying there's a fish, apparently, that swims around for most of its life, and then at the end of its life, it attaches itself to a rock, and then just catches its food from the passing water that flows past it. When it attaches to a rock, it eats its brain. It doesn't need a brain anymore. It's not moving. It doesn't need a brain to make any decisions at all. And it ends its life without a brain. And in some ways, that's what we're doing. We're attaching ourselves to a rock, metaphorically, and we're just sitting there watching the world go by. And guess what? We don't need a brain. The brain says, see you later. So the aging brain, we have a responsibility, I think, <coughs> an aging workforce to help them engage that brain, keep the neural pathways going, and build cognitive capacity. And finally, we also know that in a frantic world, you don't learn unless you have time to reflect, and be present, and engage, and think. And we also know that things like multitasking are a myth. We don't multitask, we just switch. And younger people can switch faster than older people, but it doesn't mean they're multitasking. The brain can only focus on one thing. And clearing space, being able to concentrate, giving space to reflect, extraordinarily important, extraordinarily important for learning. And these lessons are, are, are fairly straightforward and obvious, and we should have them as an audit. And we should keep an eye on what else is coming down the line. Because learning fascinates neuroscientists. It's the thing they can, they can watch the brain learn. It's a really important, complex part of what makes the brain and therefore what makes us human and what, what being is. So they're going to spend a lot of time and effort learning about learning. And I think we should give them the humble, um, humble attention of just for a few seconds. So let's see what you have rather than say, ah, oh, we've been doing this for 20 years. You want to say something? Just on that point, you use the phrase, 
sorry. The user says learning about the learning system. I just yes. wanted to, just to let everybody know that there is a, a move that takes place in Coursera, a massive open online course, by, I can't remember which university it is in America, but a number of neuroscientists, and it's called Learning How to Learn. So if you have a Google Ram for that and look at that, I've been taking it myself and found it to be perfectly pitched for people that are probably in our roles to give us just enough understanding around neuroscience from a how to create learning programs perspective without overdoing it or doing it down too much. So learning how to learn MOOC through Coursera and uh, found it invaluable. Really Thank you, Craig. Cool. There's also University of Birmingham MOOC on uh, Future Learn, which is the OU uh, MOOC platform, which is a short course, only four weeks, but it's a really interesting introduction to neuroscience by a very good team at the University of Birmingham. So it's a British one too. Okay. Done that to death. Anyone want to say anything? Follow through on that. Or should we move on? Yes. Just a quick question on the reflection thing. In an age where employers are always looking at pressure on these specialists, yes. courses, yes. how do you deal with that dilemma that you can't find for reflection? Well, I think, I think it comes into. Can I move the, Oh, here we go. The, the, the next one and, and the next one and the next one. The, the, the whole issue around impact. You're trying to make more impact. And I think it's the kind of conversation you have. And the conversation is, we need to maximize the impact of this. You're putting a lot of time, effort, and money into this. I want to prove to you that you're getting the most bangs for the buck possible. And in those circumstances, I think you, you can show them the, the, show them the literature, but you're much better off proving it. If you have one program where there's no room at all, it's just not built in. Another program where you build in elements for reflection running through and then you can test three months, six months down the track. I think, I think you can demonstrate that that's true. That what you're doing is not wasting time, you're actually adding value. So it's the way you structure the learning. And no one really challenges the way you structure the learning. You have more, much more power and autonomy in this field than you realize. But the challenge is to do less uh, uh, sorry, to do with less resources and to do more. But if you do that, no one's going to say, why is that five minute break in there? What's that going to do with it? Right, take that out and that save. You could, if you did those six of those, you'd save half an hour. No one really challenges on that level. When you talk about reflection, it's not, right, you need an hour and a half now to go away. It's often five minutes just to gather your thoughts. And, and processes, just, just building processes. On Saturday, I go to America and I teach on a doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania. We've built into this very intense doctoral program, morning reflection, 20 minutes. And we just get people to reflect on where they are, what, what's going on in the program, what they learned, where the highlights are. And it, it's as simple as that. And you could argue, my God, they've flown from all over the world. They want content. It's actually proved massively important at the end of the day we do a bringing the learning together session. So we've taken out an hour and a half of a traditional um, uh, management program, which was used to be packed from morn to night, 8.30 to 9.30 at night, content, 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 because that's what we thought people wanted for their money. The truth is, it's not, it's not right. And we now have time when they, they we put them on work, we sit them at the table, they have dinner together, and there's no agenda. They just talk and it's part of the program. And all of those things, no one said you can't do that. Well, we had one guy, one guy who worked, a banker, said, uh, value for money, I, 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 we're finishing too early. You know, I reckon I could go on till 10. And he just got drowned out by everyone else saying, shut up, shut up, Joe. So people like it. And it ends up with much better impact, much better impact. Okay, any other questions about neuroscience? Let's go back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the next challenge is addressing the whole issue of the workplace and the workplace culture and the bigger issue of disillusionment and disengagement from the workforce. And you know, the, the study in the US that they do every year showing how many, what percentage of the American workforce are disengaged, it never ever goes hard, it, it, ne it never gets better. 30% of the workforce are, are actively disengaged. Something like 30% of the workforce are engaged, and the other 40% are kind of on the edge, the swaying, the swaying. 
And up until now, that, that bigger picture of learning and the bigger, bigger issue of culture never really picked up. But I think now you've got to take a stake in all that. And, and I think learning can be a massive motivator. But you've got to do it right. You know, if, you, if you're doing, as I heard in this room three years ago from one saying that, that um, we get all my staff have free access to the online program. We really encourage them to learn after they've done compulsory courses. And someone said, well, how many compulsory courses are there? 73. <laughs> it's not going to happen, is it? It's not, then I would imagine that virtually no one ever gets past the 73. You know, 73 in your day. So that, that whole issue of how you create active engaged <coughs> people, and some of that is about all the other things we've been talking about, which is around encouraging people to be active, thinking, communicating, talking, getting learning as a byproduct of the organisation rather than the, 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 the mainstream. Learning will emerge out of all sorts of other ways of, of engaging staff. And that's why Lloyds are focusing on social learning, because they're missing huge tricks and opportunities, because people know stuff. And most people are reasonable human beings and like to share stuff. But they won't do it because there's an opportunity. If you saw um, Towards Maturity last year, their focus on social learning, what they found was that 66% of the people they, they asked said they would willingly share what they knew, but there was no way of doing it in the workplace. No way of doing it. So 66% out of 100, and 22% were doing it at the moment. So 66 plus 22, that leaves 12 who won't do it, who are not interested. Well, you know, we'll live with that. If you could get 88% of your people engaged, you, you won't get them. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, yeah go on. Yes, it is. It's, it, yes, it's humiliating. The, the, to create a culture of asking is much harder than it seems. Putting up, a, putting up a page on the internet and saying, ask any questions you like, it's not as easy as that. And many organisations have done just that, and guess what, there are no questions. Because we all want to answer the question we don't all want to ask. If you ask, you admit weakness. You admit you don't know something that may be quite important for your job. You, you admit that this whole thing isn't as seamless as it might appear. So there's a big cultural aspect to asking and a big cultural aspect to the way in which you answer. And if you answer, you idiot, of course it's obvious. You're not going to get anyone asking again. So it's, it's managing that process and nurturing it, and it's slow. And it kind of happens on its own if you set the conditions right. And if you try and force it and demand and say everybody in this company will ask six questions a week, it's just not going to work. But that's how organisations have responded. This social learning stuff, we, we can easily manage that. Right, note goes around from the chief executive. Everyone will ask six special weeks, post them on here, and everyone will get three replies. It's just, it's not good. It's not good. So, there's a, a willingness to share, a willingness to admit what you don't know, but only in safe environments. It's got to work for the organisation. And it's cultural, ultimately. Yeah. I think um, it's, it's hard to do that with technology, and it goes back to the sort of CEO idea yeah, that um, uh, if you've got a, an organisation that's aligned around that area, you can you do this locally with people who have trust at uh, a local level. It's hard to capture information around that if you've got peers and colleagues who trust and you're willing to open up and share with share my yes. These are my development yes. needs. This is what I'm being appraised on. Yes. You can imagine that would be. Yes. You've used a really important word, and that word is trust. But I always said that L&D should be the guardians of trust in the organisation. And I think L&D should be looking straight at straight the organisation in the eye and say this is a low trust organisation, you're never going to get beyond this. And I think L&D should take some of the ownership of building trust. You can, it, there's, it, trust is not something that just happens by magic and is there or not there. Trust is something that develops over time. And trust can be destroyed really quickly. It takes a long time to build. But many organisations don't even think about trust. I, I think you should be talking about trust because it underpins everything you just said. 
trust is a fundamental word. Learning is self-exposure in many ways. And self-exposure requires a trusting, safe environment, as well as being an exciting environment. So I think you're absolutely right. I just... I, I just uh, Nigel, just about three, three or four minutes. Yes, OK. Well, I'll, I'll stop here. I'll stop on this one. Um, one of the things that I, I get exercised about is the failure to really deliver on impact. And, and one of the things that I, I think is incredibly important, that you should not be, you don't measure the impact. The organisation measures the impact. So it's a coalition between you delivering something and the organisation seeing whether it's worked or not worked. And just that insight changes the whole game, I think. And how do you measure impact? Well, you can do complicated surveys and you can do deep analysis and regression and statistics, but you could also just interview a few people. And if you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answers. And when you interview people to measure impact, you don't ask the learners only. You ask their peers. You ask the, their, their managers. You ask the people in other parts of the organisation. And how do you, how do you know whether you're that the organisation is satisfied with your learning, you say to them, before you start, what is the change you want to see? Can you see that change? Can you see things are changing? And if no one but you can see anything changing, then you, you've got to go back to the drawing board. So I, I think there's a process of ownership. I don't believe you need to bring in expensive consultants to come and create incredible models for you. Um, I don't believe that you measure impact the minute something finishes on the way out, fill in this form. Oh, great, everyone loved it. It's nothing to do with it. It's about the ripples going out in the organisation over time, preferably not even thought about for a month, and maybe then three months, and perhaps even six months. But if you want to really prove the value of learning, you have to be able to prove the value of impact. And the nonsense that you can't do this... now. People say it's impossible to be totally objective about it. I think that's probably right. I use a phrase, roughly reasonable. Now, who decides what's roughly reasonable? Not you. You ask the organisation, if you see this, will you believe this has happened? And if, they, and if they say, yep, or no, I need to see a little bit more than that, say, right, OK, what is it you want to see? You can, they will identify what they expect. Your job is to give the indicators that that is happening in the organisation. They will tell you what's roughly reasonable. So you don't bust your gut trying to be 100% sure. If they say, just give us 50% certainty, that will be enough for me. Maybe some things they want more certainty, other things they want less certainty. But you need to focus on impact. The key word is impact, not evaluation. It's impact, and that is done everywhere outside the learning team by the organisation. You just take that away and you begin to implement that it can make a massive difference in the nature of the dialogue and conversation you have with the organisation, and it makes a big difference in terms of the, the, the embracing of learning and the acceptance of learning and the acknowledgement that, hey, it actually does something in this organisation that we can put our finger on. Instead of this nonsense that, hey, it's generally good, but we don't really know exactly what it does. Oh, yes, we can know exactly what it does. But you've got to start with that end in mind, that it's about impact and it's not your job to bring the evidence. Your job is to collate the evidence, but you get it from the organisation. And they'll tell you. If they're interested and it's important, they'll tell you very quickly. Good and bad. OK. I think we should stop. Yep. We should. Ready? We should. Ready to go. Stop. Put Thank your hands you. together. Nigel Payne. Thank you.